God's Word. If you do not have one with you, reach into the pew right in front of you, and there should be a copy of the Bible. And I encourage you to take it and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and that is toward um, the very back of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1. We conclude tonight the series, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. God with us. We learned last Sunday that Jesus Christ, or at least we were reminded of, that he is truly God, truly man, that he took upon himself flesh, that he condescended, he came down to us to live a life that we could not, to die a death that we could not, because the death that he died was one to atone for the sins of the many. It pleased the Father, Isaiah the prophet, prophesied of Christ, to bruise him. The Bible says that that upon him our transgressions were laid. He was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our transgressions. And because Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, lived a perfect and holy life, died an atoning and justifying for us death, and was buried and rose again from the third day, we have life. And it's in that life that we can call out to the Lord, O come, O come, Emmanuel, that we can call for him and pray that the Lord would send forth his Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. I've entitled tonight's sermon, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. I would like for you to start or look, look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. And we'll read through the 21st verse. Verse 18. Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Let's pray. Father, help us this evening. Help us as we seek to, to keep our hearts and minds on you, to be ever grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, to understand that, that because of his condescension, his, his condescending to us, because of his putting on the flesh, because of his coming to us, sent by your love for us, that we have life and that we can celebrate this Christmas time. Help us all tonight, Lord. To understand that Jesus Christ is the reason why we gather, is the reason why we celebrate, is really the reason why we can have joy in the midst of a world of sorrows. And Lord, our prayer again is that you would send your son soon. We ask this in his holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. I would like for us briefly to understand tonight that, that Jesus Christ has given to us a great redemption. A great redemption, a redemption that the world cannot give, a redemption that the world cannot offer. It's the redemption that come at a great cost. We will see our great redemption and we will see our great redeemer. Here in 1 Peter, I would like to back up and give you some scripture for context. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Listen to what Peter writes. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What we find right there is the, is the very key to the gospel, for it is the gospel that God sent his son, Jesus the Messiah, and that his son died on the cross and that his son was raised from the dead. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that that is the gospel, that according to the scriptures, Christ died, Christ was buried, and Christ was raised again. That is the gospel. That is the hope that we hold on so tenaciously to because it is in that hope that we have life. For Jesus Christ is the firstborn from the dead, as we were reminded Sunday, that because he lives, we too live by faith in him. So we bless God the Father here in verse 3. God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his mercy that he has shown upon us through his Son, he has given us, verse 4, an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's where no moth, no rust, 
no corruption, no uh, corrosion can get to. There in the very treasure houses of heaven, God has reserved for you and for me, for all of us who believe on his name and inheritance. We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. There's coming a day when Christ will return. There is coming a day that is the promise of Scripture, is the hope of believers, and that which we long for during this Christmas time, and really we should long for during all times, is that God sent His Son, His Son did for us what we could not do for ourselves, in that He lived, He died, He was raised again, and because we have hope and faith in Him, we have life through Him. So we praise Him, because by the power of God we've been saved, it's not of ourselves. This great redemption that we'll look at in just a moment came at a great cost, and it was the cost of the life of Christ. Verse 6 of 1 Peter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Think about that. Peter was talking about nearly 2,000 years ago that at the church, the, the church would go through some hard times, some test, times of testing, some times of, of pruning, some times of, of God firing up the, the crucible and, and raking off the draws, that God is purifying his church. And, and we see maybe even the beginning stages of some of that today in our world. We, church, must remain strong. We must remain vigilant. We must have our eyes open and our hearts fixed on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who will come again. That's what Peter is talking about. O come, O come, Emmanuel. The whole life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ is what has given us, even in these last days, hope in Him. He says, though now you do not see Him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. My, my son David read Psalm 96. And that psalm is spoke of, of a come when the nations would rejoice. And that Christ would come and he would, he would judge the nations in righteousness. My daughter Emily spoke of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah's prophecy, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we have that wonderful prophecy that has been fulfilled in Christ. Isaiah longed to see, the, the writer of Psalm 96 longed to see that day. And we have seen it by looking back through faith that Christ did come. He did come. My daughter Kara read, Of the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the prophets, they, they inquired of this, they longed for this, they were searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering to things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Church, we have the privilege and the honor to have the word of God that declares Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. We have that which the prophets look forward to, that they prophesied by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We now read this inspiration, this inspired word, uh, and we have it now when we believe in the God that it proclaims. That's why here in verse 13, Paul, excuse me, Peter, gets to the meat of it. He says, because God has blessed us, because God's abundant mercy has been lavished upon us, but because even the prophets that look forward to this, and we know all these things, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. No longer let your mind be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. No longer let your minds be stayed on the temporal things of this world. Do not let the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, nor the pride of life discourage you or tempt you or lead you away from that which God has called you to. And this Christmas time, this time, this year, we need to gird up the loins of our minds. In other words, 
We need to get our minds cleaned out and cleared up and focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. That has clear thinking and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, no matter your politics, church, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He says, we do this as obedient children, verse 14, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. That's the time before you became a believer. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In other words, God has set you apart because he is set apart. There is none other like our God. There is none like him. There's none that even approach him in likeness. He is absolute otherness. And because he is holy and sanctified, he is set apart, he is righteous in all that he is and does, we too, as image bearers of Christ and as believers in Christ, image bearers of God and believers in Christ, we too should be holy for he is holy. That's what he says in verse 16 as Peter quotes from the book of Leviticus. And so he says in verse 17, if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here, your journey, your sojourning here in fear. And now we come to tonight's text, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. So we see this great redemption that took place that was planned from before the even creation of the world, from before the foundation of the world, this great plan in the council of the triune God, this redemption, this to be purchased by God. So we need to see what the meaning of redemption is. Redemption is the liberation, it's the setting free of those in bondage to sin. It's God coming and unlocking the chains, unlocking the fetters. It's, it's God paying the price that we might no longer be in bondage to sin, but be slaves to him. And by being slaves to him, we have freedom. You say, Brother Gabe, that sounds counterintuitive. Or to be a slave, to be a slave? To, to go from bondage to sin to bondage to Christ? What does that mean? What, what Peter is saying in here is that, that we're not redeemed by some, somebody coming posting some cosmic bail. But rather, God the Son coming in human flesh and paying the price for our sins to set the captive free. We have this great redemption... That is bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. This redemption holds the idea of the full purchase price paid to secure the release of us as sinners. We look in the Old Testament and we see that God has always been a redeeming God. He has always been the, the God of redemption. He, he takes his people and brings them to himself. Even as we see in the book of Deuteronomy, we find that in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 through 11, the Lord did not set his love on you, speaking to the covenant people of Israel, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. What God is speaking of through Moses or to Moses and to God's covenant people is that it is God who pays the price. It is God who does the work. It is God who is the author and the finisher of our salvation. So Christmas, when we gather around a Christmas tree or whatever traditions your families may hold, and we began to open gifts, we, we need to hearken back to the greatest gift that was given, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel proclaimed to the shepherds, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We, we find that, that it is because of God that we can have peace with God. God continues to say to Moses there in Deuteronomy 7, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with those who hates him. With him who hates him, he will repay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today to, judge, to observe them. What God did through his son Jesus Christ 
was to pay the full redemption price, to gain ownership of that which he purchased. And church, we need to understand that, that Christ has purchased all believers of all ages. Those believers of times past, those believers now, and if God should, should uh, allow time to continue, the believers that shall come and believe on his name, it is they and all those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved because Christ made it possible and because Christ did all of the work. That's why in the culmination of time in Revelation 5, it says they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, speaking of Christ, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You see, back to Psalm 96 that was read during the, the lighting of the first advent or lighting of the candles. We, we look back and we see that, that Christ did it all and he did it all for all of his glory. We find that this redemption, this great redemption that is ours by faith. Is nothing less than complete, total, utter satisfaction of the debt that was owed. You see, we're born into sin. We all sin because we fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous among us, no, not one, in ourselves. But Christ did for us that which we could not do for ourselves. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who is truly God, truly man, who took upon himself flesh. So in him we have redemption. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see, that's the great redemption. And we can talk about the redemption that is ours by faith. But if we fail to go to the great redeemer himself and give glory to God the Father because of Christ the Son. If we fail to make much of Jesus during this Christmas time or any time, we are failing in the task that God has called us to do. For Jesus Christ is the reason that we live and breathe and have our being. It is the, for the glory of Almighty God. All things were created for Him and by Him, and they were created through Him that He may receive all the glory and honor and praise. This great Redeemer did not redeem us, as Peter writes here, with corruptible things like silver or gold. You know, if you had enough silver, you had enough gold, if you had enough money, you can purchase most anything around here. You can purchase most anything around the world if you had enough money. But you can't purchase salvation for your soul. You can heap up mounds of treasure from here to Mars, but it will not be enough to cover your sin or to pay the price, the debt of that sin. You see, it was nothing less than the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our good works cannot obtain this redemption. Our money is not the means of this redemption. So by what means is our redemption? What is the, the means by, by which we are set free from the penalty of our sins? And given life that is free in Christ, well, it's the blood of Christ. It was secured by blood. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Jesus Christ had to shed his life's blood. And by that I mean he died on the cross. Truly man, this Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is also truly God, this humanity, he died on the cross. He experienced the agony. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us he became sin who knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. That because of his life that was completely perfect, he was tempted in all ways like you and me and everyone else, but yet he was without sin. So Christ was able by his shed blood to purchase us as his bride, to pay the price. Paul in his exhortation to the elders at Ephesus said in Acts chapter 20 verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. He's speaking to the elders, the, the pastors among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You see, the reason why Paul was telling the, the elders there at Ephesus that is that, that this church that has been purchased 
by Christ was purchased with his blood. And so the church is not to be tossed around and mistreated, but rather the people of God are to be loved and to be preached to through the word of God. And it's not through the means of ordinary things, rather, uh, that the world embraces, but rather through the preaching of the word, the sharing of the good news of Christ, to serve others. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom. For many, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all to be testified in due time. And you know what the due time is? We're testifying of it right now. We're saying that Christ is the great redeemer. He is the one who has purchased our great redemption. This Christmas is all about that Christ was born of a virgin at the right time, born under the law to redeem those under the law. That he might come and save us from the penalty of the law. That we might be his people. And there is the most wonderful benefit of this. We're saved and we're redeemed. What from our aimless conduct back to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. We're redeemed with, with, not with corruptible things like silver or gold. From our aimless conduct received by tra tradition from our fathers. There are so many things that we do. That are vain and futile. That are worthless and empty. There's so many things in life that people sell their souls for. Give their lives for. But I will tell you this. Yield to Christ tonight and you'll never regret it. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Call upon him while there is time. Seek him while he may be found. You turn from your wicked ways and you turn to the Lord. That is the message of Christmas. That we have a Redeemer who lived and died and was raised from the dead, who ascended, and as the word of God promises, is coming again. This great Redeemer has not left us to himself, or to ourselves rather, but he's given us his spirit. He's given us hope. One of the benefits of this great redemption is that we are his and his forever. We're forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future. We have a righteous standing. For God, just as those songs we sang just a few moments ago. We have no condemnation as believers in Christ. We have access to the Father. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we can obey the Lord's righteous requirements. You remember Sunday we said there in Colossians chapter 1 that, that He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love and whom we have redemption through His blood the of sins. The writer to the Hebrews says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Now listen to this once for all. Having obtained eternal redemption. You see, our great redemption is eternal. We don't have to put Christ on the cross continuously at some mass service every week. We, we don't have to be saved over and over and over and over again because what Christ did, he did once for all. He saved his people from their sins. That's why we find in, Ma in Mark, excuse me, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, that you call his name Jesus, as the angel said, for he shall save his people from their sins. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Church, we're not saved just to sit and just to wait on the Lord's return, but rather we're to serve the Lord with gladness, awaiting his return. We're to love him and to love others. And for this reason, the writer to the Hebrews continues, for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He came to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. We were once strangers, but now we're his children. There's something in Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. 
I want to take you back to Revelation 5. I'll read to you just briefly. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation have, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. You see this great redemption that we have that Christ has purchased for us through his blood, not with silver and gold, not with the things of this world that will pass away but by the blood of the eternal Son of God. And He has done this, that we might be set free from our sins, set free from aimless tradition, and that we might live for Him. That we might live for His glory. Our faith and our hope is in Him. So we rejoice every Christmas when we remember that great redemption that has been secured by our great Redeemer our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of you here may be wondering, can Christ, will Christ, or even should Christ, have paid the price for my sin? I will tell you this, that if you will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He will save you. He will forgive you of all of your sin, past, present, and future. In the name that is above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ, give you a new name, redeemed child of God, his own child. Call upon him while there is time. Life is short and death is short. Sin is the reason. But Christ is the cure. We call upon Christ and we remember Christ, not only here at Christmas, not only at Easter time, but every day. Because even the breath in our lungs this very moment is a gift from the lover of our souls. So what do we do with that knowledge? Do we just hold on to it and, and tuck it away in the recesses of our minds? No, we act upon it. How do we act upon it? We live our lives in service to Him. Because He has redeemed us, because He has set us free, because He has paid the price, because we are His and He is ours, we glorify His name and we live life with joy great expectation and hope that one day, one day soon, the Son of God who came 2,000 years ago was born and laid in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. The ones that the angels attested to, the ones that the shepherds came and worshipped and then went and proclaimed. The one that went to the temple when he was a 12-year-old boy and told his parents, I must be about my father's business. The one that at 30 years of age called disciples to himself and walked among his people and taught them and shared with them and then died for us on the cross. The one who was buried and the one who rose the third day. The one who a few weeks later ascended back to the father. We look forward to that one, the Lord Jesus, who is coming again. That's the promise of God. And that's the hope of God's people. So, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look upon Him, believe in Him, and live for Him. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, how good You are. Thank You for the gift of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank You for the hope and the life that we have in and through Him. Lord, may You save lost people to Yourself. Lord, may you use us for your glory as your redeemed. God, may we point people to you. Lord, may we, may we point our families to you. May we serve you. We ask this in Jesus Christ.